In this chapter, we're going to be looking at torque and equilibrium. Torque is the ability of a force to cause a rotation. So the PowerPoint slides do a very good job of, of laying out the diagrams and um, equations that you need to do the calculation. But something that might be a little bit confusing is if you have a bar like this and the pivot point, also called the fulcrum, also called the axis of rotation, the definition of that is the point, the line that goes through that axis of rotation does not move if the object rotates. But as far as we're concerned, nothing is going to be rotating. So you can actually put that axis of rotation anywhere you want on the object. So let's say we apply a force like this to this bar that is fixed at the left end. If we define the angle theta between the bar and the force like that, there's a couple of different definitions that your, um, that your textbook uses. So first of all, the line of action of a force is simply the line that goes through the force. So this is called the line of action for that force. It's just an imaginary line and you can extend it as long as you need to extend it. So the perpendicular distance from the axis of rotation to that line of action, they call that the moment arm. Okay, so now sometimes that's also called the lever arm. And then they call this distance along here, the, the distance along the rod, they call that the radial arm. But sometimes you're going to see books that call this the lever arm or call this the moment arm. So beware of different notations. But your textbook calls this the radial line. Now you can see the relationship between r, r perpendicular, and theta. It's a right angle triangle. And so r perpendicular is r sine theta. OK, so that's how those two distances are related. Now, as far as torque goes, torque is the ability of this force to cause this thing to rotate. Well, this force has two components. Let's go down here and draw that again. So now if we look at the components of the force, it has a component perpendicular to the rod. We'll call it F perpendicular. This is F. And it has a component parallel to the rod, F parallel. Now F parallel doesn't cause any torque at all because if you push on a rod straight towards the axis of rotation along the rod, that's not gonna make it rotate. So there's no torque from this component. So that doesn't come into the torque, but it certainly does come into any kind of um, net force equation. That is definitely a force. It's this one that creates torque. And so the closer the force is to the perpendicular, the bigger the torque it creates. Now, if this is theta, we can see that F perpendicular is F sine theta. Okay, so now what you do for torque, torque can be written in two different ways. The torque from that same force, which gets the symbol tau, you can either say it's R perpendicular times F, or you can say it's R times F perpendicular. And it's gonna give you exactly the same result. So this is R sine theta times F, and this is R F sine theta, exactly the same thing. So however you want to calculate it, however you want to think about it, you will get the same result. And depending on the situation, sometimes I like to use R and F perpendicular, and other times I like to use R perpendicular. So it depends on the situation. OK, so what are we going to be doing with torques? Basically, we're going to be looking at equilibrium. Nothing is going to move. We simply are going to balance torques and forces. OK, there's two types of equilibrium. We've already seen translational equilibrium. That's when the net force is zero. And we did that in chapter five. But now we're gonna have rotational equilibrium. And that's when the net torque is zero. Now, when we did chapter five, the net force being zero, we had all the forces basically coming out of the center of a box. And so if all the forces are coming out of the center, there's no rotation to be considered. You simply worry about the net force being zero. But now if forces don't come out of the center, so for example, let's say we have a wheel or a disc or something. If now we have forces applied at 
different locations, not going through the center, then we're going to have torques. And so if we applied exactly the same force, say this one was 10 newtons and this one was 10 newtons, and this is the distance r, now you can use capital R or small r, doesn't really matter, radius is usually a capital R here. Now the situation here is the net force is zero because 10 to the right, 10 to the left, F net is zero. That thing is not gonna move up, down, left or right. However, it will rotate because the net torque is not zero. Now torques have positives and negatives. A clockwise torque is, an, is actually a negative torque. Now this is, the reason for that is if you take your right hand and you put your thumb through the center of this wheel and you think about this is a clockwise torque. Think about which way the wheel is gonna rotate if that were the only force on it, that would make the wheel rotate clockwise. And notice how when you do that, your thumb points into the page when you twirl your fingers clockwise and in is it the negative Z direction. That's why it's a negative. We're not gonna to be too worried about that though because we're just gonna balance torques. Counterclockwise torques by convention are positive. They are actually vector quantities and it's the direction of your thumb. But once again, we're not too worried about that. So this creates a clockwise torque as well. And so the net torque on that wheel would be negative R times F for the top one plus R times F for the bottom one. So we negative two times R times F. That is not in equilibrium. There is a net torque. Now, how are we gonna do it so it is in equilibrium? Well, we have to do it so there's no net torque. We could go like this with 10 Newtons and 10 Newtons. Now this one would be a clockwise torque, but this would be a counterclockwise torque. And so the net torque here would be zero. That thing would not rotate. However, the net force on it is not zero. It's 20 newtons to the right. That thing is gonna move 20 newtons to the right, even though it's not gonna rotate. So that's not in equilibrium either. So to get it to be in equilibrium, we're gonna have to do no net torque and no net force. How about this? If we put 10 newtons there and 10 newtons there, we would have no torque and no net force. And this thing then would be in equilibrium. Okay, so the kinds of questions that you're gonna be asked to do will be applying the equations for equilibrium, which are F net equals zero and, and torque net equals zero. However, the way, the way I like to think about it is that for forces, all the up forces equal all the down forces and all the forces to the right must balance and equal the forces to the left. You don't need any negatives. You just make sure everything's in component form for your forces and you balance up equals down, right equals left. For torques, you don't have to worry which ones are negative, which ones are positive. You just balance clockwise torques must equal counterclockwise torques and everything is positive. So those are the working equations for equilibrium. So these are equations of equilibrium. Okay, so let's look at some examples that you're gonna come across. Uh, you will come across this one where you have this rod pivoted about its end point and somebody is holding it up with the force of tension in some string. And now you have to know what all the forces are on this thing. It has a weight. So the force of gravity would be, now when it says a uniform rod, always put the force of gravity in the middle of the rod at the center of mass. If it says a, a massless rod, then you don't put that vector in. Now also on the floor here, there's gonna be a normal force. Now there's no friction here because there's nothing left and right. In order to, to have friction being used to keep that thing in that position, you would have to have some component of force left and right up here where FT is, but there isn't. So up equals down. So we know that that normal force plus the force of tension must equal the weight 
but they're not going to tell you the force of tension and they're uh, I guess they do tell you the weight but we're looking for the normal so those are two unknowns so we can't use that so now we do torques now when you're choosing where to put the axis of rotation always put it on top of the force you don't know so I, I could put it anywhere I want on here this thing is not moving so but I'm going to put it up here on the location where ft is because I don't know what ft is now in this case I'm going to use the definition of r perpendicular because that's by far the easiest so I'm going to do my lines of action of these forces I'm going to go from axis of rotation over that will be r perpendicular one and then I'm going to go over well, I'm going to move over so I don't make a mess here and then I'm going to go over to here hit it now that's r perpendicular two so the normal force, so this is torques, clockwise equals counterclockwise. Next, I wanna decide which one's clockwise, which one's counterclockwise. If I put my finger on O and think about Fn trying to pull this rod around, that would be a clockwise. So this one's a clockwise, Fn is gonna do clockwise. Similarly, put your finger on O and imagine what Fg is trying to do. It doesn't matter whether it succeeds or not, it's trying to make this thing rotate counterclockwise. So then I put C, C, W beside that. Okay, and FT doesn't create any torque at all because it's there is no lever arm for it. It's right on top of the force. So there's no torque from FT here. Okay, so the clockwise torque is lever arm times force, lever arm times force. So the clockwise one, lever arm, R perpendicular two times FN must equal R perpendicular one times FG. There's the torque equation. Now we don't necessarily know what R per perpendicular one and two are in this particular case, but we know one has to be exactly double the other because this force FG is in the middle. And so R perpendicular two must be twice R perpendicular one. That allows us to cancel out what R perpendicular one is. So two R perpendicular one times FN, I'm gonna sub that into here must equal r perpendicular one times fg and it turns out that fn is just half of fg okay so i think you have a question like that on your mastering physics another typical example would be if you have a rod attached to a wall and then there's a rope holding it up like this rope might go all the way up to the wall. That would be the force of tension. And then maybe there's some mass hanging here. And maybe the rod has some kind of mass as well, Fg. Okay, so this would be half the length of the rod. If it's a uniform rod, it will always be a uniform rod for you guys. This would be the full length of the rod L. Now we can, in this case, if given theta here, I would do the FT perpendicular method. And I would just use L and L over two. So this mass hanging down here, this would be a clockwise torque. That's trying to pull the rod to move clockwise. Axis of rotation, we'll put at the wall. There are a couple of forces at the wall, but we're not asked for them. We're not worried about them, but beware there are forces there at the wall. So this mass hanging off the end of the rod is clockwise. The mass of the rod itself is gonna do clockwise. And then the counteracting force that creates counterclockwise is that perpendicular component of the tension. So the torque equation here, clockwise equals counterclockwise would be lever arm times mg for the hanging mass. This would be mg that force plus lever arm out to the weight of the beam. Those are the clockwise. And then that would be balanced by the lever arm for the tension force, which is L times FT sine theta. And depending on what you're asked and what you're told, there's the equation for that beam. Notice how L cancels out everywhere. So you don't even need to know the length. So that's a typical example that you're gonna come across. Okay, so that's probably it for this chapter.